And look, there they are. They've come to this. To this office. Metal cabinets. File folders everywhere. They sit in metal chairs. This couple. So many emotions, feelings of, what's the word? I mean, what's the word for fear plus um, what? Um, not the not unpleasant pre-sick inside, suspended on the verge of a fall from a great height into what? What? Uh, fear? Fear? But not, not fear. Is momentous a feeling? Something is palpable. <laughs> My heart is, uh... Let's say happy. It's absurd. Not their happiness. No, their happiness is not absurd. No, just, you know, it, it's crazy. This, this room. This room they're sitting in is absurd. Their happiness is not. A strange room to be happy in. We're so lucky. The room smells like an old sock. Like mice and never opened windows. The couple sits in this room. Across the desk from this lawyer. This guy. <laughs> He's old. Old, old. I mean, the very essence of mortality. They've, they've forgotten his name. His teeth look sour. There is the, the sound of traffic outside. The air conditioning is shrill. Everything is yours, says this lawyer, who holds the key. He literally holds the key. A physical key. 
pressed between his index finger and his thumb. Everything is yours. His voice has a shrug in it. His voice is as thin as a whistle. The man and the woman are about to sign the agreement. The contract sits on the desk between them, a small sheaf of papers with little plastic tabs that say, sign here, sign here. The lawyer sign also here, holds a pen. Here. In one hand, a pen. In one hand, a key. The boathouse, all the buildings, all that's yours. All spelled out, it's in the contract. Fixtures and movables. To be signed with our blood. It's all yours, the woodpile, the cups and saucers, knives and forks, pictures on the wall, with ink, not blood. To be clear. No, the, the pen was not filled with blood. <laughs> we're, we were sitting in this lawyer's absurd office. He holds a pen filled with ink. Okay, it was momentous, is my point. If you're having second thoughts. I'm excited. He is so fearful. And like all fearful men, all he wants to do is find a solvable problem and solve it. He wants this to be manageable and then to manage it. The lawyer holds the pen in his bloodless hand... He is smiling. There is a picture on his desk. A beautiful cottage by a beautiful lake. Ruth Lake. <laughs> this is almost too good to be true. So very good. Like in a dream or in a movie when a thing feels so very good and just so the right thing that it also feels doomed. I mean, it all happened so quickly. <laughs> Everything sweet and somehow paper thin and therefore fragile and fictional. When I am content, when I am comfortable and happy, I feel like a storybook version of myself. Too quickly. We were too impulsive. We got it so cheaply, there must be something wrong with it. So, the pen. And the key. I take the pen, I pluck the pen from the old man's fingers. The momentous pen. <sighs> here and here. A flourish. Signing our life away. Here and... Signing our life away? What? Signing our... It's a, it's a thing to say. It's just a thing to say in the silence. Which you fear. Silences are awkward. I'm not the only one who thinks so. And then you click the pen. Click, click. And said... Here goes nothing. I, I mean... A new beginning? That's probably what I meant. Are you with me? Hey, why, why, why do you... Do you seem... I, I'm here. I'm here. Are we arguing? I'm just floating in the dark. I'm here. Yes. Presence being physically located in space. He says it to be reassuring, but I really think it's a plea. He wants to be located by her out here in the, 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 the terrifying. I don't understand what we're arguing about. Why am I so nervous? I didn't feel this way about the condo. What, what I possibly meant was that, that we are making a commitment. We've done something irreversible. Mortgaging a piece of our future, committing ourselves to this new things, to this land, uh, this real estate. Mm -hmm. Our own piece of the planet. Okay, a few days ago, you took my hand and we did this little thing, this little leap. Take a lover's leap with me. Do this with me, you said. We stood in the living room at the edge of the sky blue throw rug, rug that my mom made for me and we left. Onto the blue rug, into the living room of our condo. Splash. And I did it. I held your hand and I did it. If all else fails, I'm saying... I'm going to throw up. It has value. There are realities to consider. Somehow, in a way they can't describe, in a way that is woven so intricately into the fiber of their being, they don't know why, but this purchase of land is in some way a manifestation of their love. Something concrete. It has something to do with faith, but in a way they can't put into words. They, they keep trying to put it into words, words they will never speak. See, we make words and then follow them back to the thought we think created them. Pick through our words to find our thought. But this... This feels right, like closure. Like a chance for their love to... Uh, we think we know what we mean when we say love. Well, I know what I mean. We think we know. I know. A chance for their love to become more... Solid. Something about land. What is real? Happiness. Debt? Fidelity? Is there something they missed? Some detail? Something more? Something other? That their happiness means nothing. A primal fear, fear of their absurdity, leads them to seek refuge from that absurdity. But they don't understand that absurdity cannot resolve itself in the rational, in the real. Running. Running away. Are they running into it? But who doesn't do this? He signs the papers. And here, and here? This is real. This is real. If they are 
Absurd. Uh, it's not their fault. I mean, who isn't absurd? Are we depressed? What? Nothing. None of this is spoken out loud. You speak these things under your breath, into your pillow. If you do, do, do not, if you do speak it, you forget and continue on as before. He hands the pen to her. Here goes nothing. <laughs> Click. She signs the papers. The woman signs. Every step they take, no matter how considered, no matter how many lists, pros and cons, and flowcharts they make, late night conversations, however many maps they draw and redraw, leads them over the edge and into absurdity that they crave. They don't know they crave it. They think they crave meaning. They crave destruction. They are too timid to destroy themselves. So they destroy everything around them. They think their deeper meaning lies in this place. That this place holds the key. To what? How can they possibly know? She hands the pen back to the lawyer. And the lawyer stands slowly, with difficulty, smiles, shakes her hand, and hands us the key. His hand is dry and cold. His teeth... He calls us cottagers. He says something like, welcome to cottage country. He says, hey, you cottagers. We ride the elevator down. It's all a blur. We're in the lobby. I throw up into a potted plant. We are silent on our drive back to our condo. He makes me a coffee in the stovetop espresso maker. Our second of the day, we hold hands across the table. This is good. It's so good. An act of faith. An act of blind faith. A lover's leap. All faith is blind. And we're eager to see it. We've only seen the picture on the listing. We make plans to go up for the weekend. It's a three and a half hour drive. We ask the girl down the hall to look after our cat. I worry about the cat. The cat will survive. That this interruption in her routine will cause her to chew on her leg again. Okay, the, the cat won't die of starvation over the weekend. He makes a joke at my expense. In front of the girl. He's strutting around like a peacock. I understand that it's natural, but it bothers She's me. She's 15. No big deal. She's pretty. I become self-conscious of the failings of my own body, of the passage of time. We put on the CBC as we pack. Syrian rebel forces have retaken Retake Aleppo, Aleppo, but sources in the area say, say that their the grip is tenuous at, at best. best. There are renewed calls from within the UN, UN to, to toughen, toughen sanctions. sanctions against the Assad regime. Oh, God. I can't do this right now. It's so depressing. She streams some upbeat music. They bop around. Sweaters, clothes, rubber boots. But the news has poisoned it. Toiletries, sheets and blankets, towels, bathing suits, not thinking of the children. Try not to think of how little we deserve this luck. Try not to think of sweatshops, little children, of climate change. Well, if we deserved it, it, it wouldn't be luck. The gas will burn on the drive up. I understand that a certain amount of suffering, a certain amount of injustice, a certain amount of, of, of environmental degradation have... We're conscious of our and privilege. We're, we're not assholes about it. But we also have to cut ourselves some slack, no? I mean, we, we may not deserve it. But we have earned it. To some degree? We're going to be stewards of the land. I so long to wash my hair in the lake. Hot dogs, fruits and veggies, marshmallows. But I don't want to poison the lake. Hardware and sporting goods store. So I get, go about selecting a shampoo like it, it's some kind of Bordeaux. I choose this sulfate-free, paraben-free, gluten-free, vegan shampoo. Fishing rods, matches, sleeping bags, cooler. We'll need an axe. An axe. I want to swing an axe to chop wood. Maybe chop down a tree. Now they are naked. Mm, it feels so nice. Oh my God, your body feels like home. Familiar. Good familiar. The journey back to each other's bodies. We let each other down. And your smell. You smell so familiar <laughs> that I don't smell you anymore. We were growing apart. I mean, it happened so slowly over time, you, you don't even feel it. I felt it. Me too, but I, I, I didn't know what it was that I was feeling. I felt it, and I knew what it was. We discussed making love. I mean, we are, after all, only bodies. We only have recourse to this world. To each other. Through our bodies. And our words. Which come out of our bodies. <laughs> But our minds make us feel absent from our bodies, but, but we never are. Our bodies have requirements. Our bodies are requirements, but we decide to wait. We'll have sex when we get to the cottage. Celebrate a new beginning. Hmm. I'm thinking of the girl down the hall. She'll be feeding our cat this weekend. I think of her hand as it strokes the cat's fur. 
What are you thinking? What are you thinking? I really resented it when the lawyer called us cottagers. He didn't mean anything by it. I didn't like the implication. Well, he doesn't know us. And look at him. Is he happy? Like he's never been out of that room. <laughs> he winked at me when he handed over the key. <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> Gave me shivers. Well, if he knew what we'd been through. We're after something primal. Something true. Something to do with... Ourselves. In nature. I want to blur the lines, blur the boundaries of ourselves in nature. Challenge ourselves. Selves. Selves. It's a weird word. When do we invent these things called selves? <laughs> these selves <laughs> that long to know where they belong. I feel like, how do I say this? Like there is myself, me, my experience of uh -huh. me, and why is that separate from nature? What we call nature, this word we've given to everything, not ourselves. We've made ourselves separate from it by giving it a name. Are we crazy? That's crazy a thing you can do together. We can sure try. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh. We fall asleep. I dream the dream I've dreamt every night for the last month. Now it is morning. I wake up. I don't. We load bags into our car. The girl down the hall cradles the cat in her arms. I can see her in the window. Suddenly I'm worried. She'll be fine. What, what if she dies? The cat, not the well, girl. We're only going up for the weekend. A long weekend? Not long enough to die in. I'll, I'll, I'll text the girl when we get there. Is there a text where we're going? Blow a kiss to the condo as they leave it behind. The cat watches us drive away. Stoplight. Green light. Pedestrians. Slowly out of the city, traffic at a standstill. The air shimmers with the heat of too many cars. Roll down the window. The traffic, the air. Roll the window up again. Other faces and other cars. None of them happy. Look at that guy. <laughs> Look at his face. <laughs> he wasn't born with that face. He turned his face into that. Everyone follows their dreams and no one is happy. Stuck in traffic. That's what we've been for years. Stuck in metaphorical traffic. Yes, yes. Why are we so intent on inventing new ways to make our lives unbearable? I mean, the sky's the limit. Dreaming of flight. Not even the limit. Outer space. Stars and void. What obstacles do we have beyond what's in our heads? Beyond what my mother did to me? Beyond what we do to each other? Something just occurred to me. Yes? This is how horror movies begin. The unsuspected couple, full of hope, naive, leave the city, remove themselves into nature. We watch them at a remove, and we see how doomed they are. Is someone watching us? Screaming at us, turn back, turn back before it's too late. The radio plays music, and slowly they make their way out of the city. The traffic gets looser. I'm giddy. <laughs> she lets her hair down. She pours coffee for him. He drives. She peels an orange for him and hands it to him in sections. Bursting with sweetness, city turns into slightly less than city. The city losing resolution in developments as they segue into country. Geometric clusters of similar houses, developments, then farmland. He drives. She opens her window. Her hand carves the wind. The radio breaks up into static, and then they give up on it. The roads get rougher. Then gravel roads. Time. Time. More time. Time slipping in and out of focus. Look! Ducks, ducks, ducks in formation flying across the sky. Geese. Uh, large birds of some kind. Maybe, maybe those will land on our lake. Oh, lake. <laughs> <laughs> blue, blue windows behind the stars. Yellow moon on the rise. Big birds flying across the sky. Throwing shadows on our eyes. Leave us. Helpless, helpless, helpless. Bump it. Silence. He's hit something. I don't blame us. Him. I saw the blur. The panicked blur of life running into, away from. It all happened so fast, the impact so inconsequential, almost only psychological. Uh, just something that happens. Uh... It's a not good thing that happens. 
a uh, bunny. The rabbit, the car. I killed a bunny. We're standing on the asphalt. It's still alive. A uh, small comfort. There's nothing we... Uh, should we... Um, put it out of its misery? I can't. I don't uh, think that is something I could do. The occasional uncomprehending car shooshes by. He gazes at the bunny. Its head is squashed to the road, the last bit of its life twitching out in its hindquarters, the hindquarters trapped in the habit of still being alive. They waited out. He is crying. Am I? It's not your fault. The horror movie unspooling in my mind. The, the hindquarters don't know. They're still hopping. So much cruelty in this world. You're not a bad person. It's suffering. Is what she says. His only attachment to this creature is through its suffering. It came out of nowhere. What is the loss that he is mourning? The kind of innocence he supposes. Maybe he sees himself in the bunny. Are we lost? They get back in the car. Driving in silence. Gradually, the rabbit vanishes from their minds. They mitigate it with words. This is a magic that words have. They stop for selfies in front of cows, pee on the side of the road. She makes a quick bouquet of roadside flowers, which she arranges in the cup holder. She thinks of her mother. Why does she suddenly miss her mother? Wishing she could call her mother. She thinks of the rabbit. Then she thinks of things not the rabbit, her father. He wonders how the cat is doing. Driving to a place they've never been. Imagining the soft, soft fur of the kitty cat curled up on the sky blue rug. We continue. A lovely sort of melancholy. Feeling like a body. Like a body succumbing to space. Relaxing into the reality of the car and the distance being covered. Like going in and out of focus. The landscape becomes wild. That quiet time on a long drive when you are at peace with the road and a kind of pleasant fatigue takes over. The dream of destination becoming imminent, but not urgent. Desired, but not longed for. Images float in and out of my mind. He is lying bloody on the forest floor, and I am decorating him with flowers. We miss the turnoff at Alsace and have to double back. All part of the adventure. We hang a right at the old barn, which is more of a ruin of a barn than a barn. Memory of a barn. And the road goes from paved to that kind of oily asphalt that falls just short of paved, which then yields to a fully gravel road. Rocks spit out from underneath the tires, pop against the undercarriage. I think it's called an undercarriage. And we drive for what seems like forever, looking for some sign of Wolf Lake Road. Wherever that we is. We drive and we drive until I'm sure we've missed it. Somewhere along this road, we've jettisoned ourselves beyond the realm of Wi-Fi. It feels like a border crossing. Not a border between countries, but a border between realms. Suddenly the cat feels helpless and alone back in the condo. What if we never return? I fight the impulse to turn back, and the sun is going down. There it is! Take a left on Wolf Lake Road, and now it's not even gravel anymore. It's just dirt and grass, a rutted dirt road. It's just how you would imagine it. Occasional rock spits out into nowhere. It's so perfect. And the sun is almost all the way down by now. We are under a canopy of leaves. I'm guessing maple and birch. I, I, I don't really know the names of trees. The setting sun, blood red by now, peeking intermittently through leaves. Syncopated notes of quiet and light thinking if the road gets any worse than this, we'll have to... No turning back now. I, I'm not even sure a turn could be accomplished here. The road is so narrow and crammed with vegetation on either side. Slightly claustrophobic, maybe. It's almost dark. If this were a horror mo movie, I'd be thinking, hey! I force my foot onto the brakes. Back up. I put the car in reverse as the plume of dust dissipates a small wooden sign on the side of the road, half obscured by an overgrowth of lupine and cattails. I use my phone as a flashlight. Roof Lake. A hand-drawn arrow, done in red, points them down to an even rougher dirt road. It's a good eye. We make a good team. But this is even possible to imagine. It's not a road. It's basically just grass. The branches scrape along the side of the car. Like witch's fingers. Turn back. And then... Turn back. Turn back too late. We're there. They open their doors. Get out of the car. Slam. Click. The 
silent moment of ownership and possession. Unlike most things, it is even more beautiful in life. They notice the quiet. They comment on the quiet. So quiet. So quiet. And clean and fresh. They've arrived. They've come to paradise. To get away from it all. To get away from... Above them, through the leaves, the stars are beginning to appear. They look up. It's wondrous to be alive. There was this article in Popular Science. I read it years ago. There are an infinite number of realities that coexist with us. That this is in our real life. That our realer life is being lived over and over again somewhere else. Many lives that outnumber our one life. Isn't there enough absence without our adding to it? To contemplate our space in the vastness of the universe is a form of metaphorical suicide. Sweet though. We are biology. Thinking these things. Unconscious hunger. Some of it is not unconscious. Cramming ourselves with meaning. I run screaming from my body. Absolving myself. Ourselves. Our death as significant as our life. Which is to say not significant at all. Now he's thinking of that rabbit. The one that he killed. Or are its hind legs still twitching on the road, twitching for all eternity? Why did he lack the courage to do what was necessary? to do what was kind. So do you have the, the key? I wish. Uh, to the cottage. Oh, um. Click. He looks through the window of the car. She remembers the click of the door. He looks in through the driver's side window. He sees the keys hanging from the ignition. Hanged in the ignition. They try all the doors. Mosquitoes are suddenly a thing. We have to get out of these bugs. He tries not to think of that rabbit. She tries not to think that it's his fault. Tries not to think of him as a failure. A cold, damp failure. The food is in the car. All the things they bought, the food, the, the floss. The night feels like a death trap. We could smash a, a car window. Let's just get out of these bugs. They're beginning to cluster around her face. We walk along the narrow lane. He tries the door to the cottage. Uh, it's locked. I'll, I'll look for a window. He walks around the building. He runs his hand along the cedar board and batten siding. Now, he's no expert, but recognizes care and craftsmanship and is filled with gratitude toward the unknown hand that built it. I mean, it was built with love. The love of someone he will never know. It is weathered in the best possible way. He sees a window. It's pretty high up. I'll try one of the front windows. I'm getting eaten alive. A panic rising in her. I'll need a ladder. Seriously, I'm actually being eaten. they know we'd be here? Did they dream us when we were on the highway? I'm freaking myself out. The shed, filled with old tools, uh, woodworking tools, an axe. What? He caresses the handle of... Uh, an axe? No ladder. A well-stocked wood pile, no ladder, a boathouse down by the lake. A few boats stored in here, a rowboat, canoe, a kayak, all left behind by the previous owner. They seem well cared for and ready for use, like the people were just here. Light jackets, paddles, and oars, a smell. It also seems to double as a bunkhouse, evidence of children having slept here, innocent graffiti carved into the two-by-fours, which are exposed, but no ladder. By now, the sun has finally gone down. I'm covered in bites. Don't itch them. My flesh is on fire. Kick in the door. Um, I, Kick it in. A splintering sound. I rush in, sweeping the insects off me. They enter. I am slapping myself, clawing at myself. I slam the door shut. Silence. It's dark. Stepping over the threshold. This is real. You can smell that it has a history of something not machines. Its time extends into the soil, dimensions layered into... It seems unreal. Like a dream is unreal. The way you want it to be unreal, we walked into a dream. Our dream. I'm thinking about all those mosquitoes out there and their short, mindless lives. Some blind instinct for what we think of as hunger, but a 
is probably the thing that lurks beneath the hunger. Some reflexive thing. Was their hunger awakened? Did it slumber in our absence? Those bites are pretty bad. Do you have matches? He thinks. Fuck. Using her phone as a flashlight, she sees a box of matches on the oak dresser. She picks them up and shakes them. Underneath the words, safety matches, there is a line drawing of a fish, and the fish is smoking a pipe. The second match lights. She places a candle on the old oak dresser. She gasps. Faces everywhere. Look at all these pictures. The walls are covered in framed photographs. Children, 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 dancing in the candlelight. Imagine the lives of the people in these photos. The looks on their faces. Don't itch. These bites are giving off heat. A canoe, a paddle boat. Look at this. Berry picking. I want to go berry picking. They look so happy in the pictures. <laughs> a happiness radiating off the walls like heat. Look at this boy. A boy in a rowboat, the boat he saw down by the lake. Look, look how he is laughing. Why would they leave these pictures behind? I mean, why did they sell the place so cheaply? What, what happened here? A, bo bo a girl and a boy go fishing. Once upon a time, laughing in the rowboat. Jumping in the water from a rock. Little girl on daddy's shoulders. Maybe their happiness will become our happiness. These frames are probably garage sale finds. Well, they look like antiques. They make the place seem haunted. Who took these photos? Did a tragedy befall these people? Why did they sell the place? She thinks for the first time. Childhood dreams frozen and pinned to the wall. I feel naked, surrounded. Let, let's take these down now. No, I'm, I'm too tired. I feel like they're looking at me. They're not looking at anything. That's worse. I brought Sage. I want to smudge every room. I feel there's some sadness in the history here. Well, everything is tragedy. That's what being a person is. She lights the sage and fans it into this smoke. I release all energies that no longer serve me, all negativity that surrounds me, and all the fears that limit me. They go from room to room. The place seems bigger on the inside than it does on the outside. Now each other. He coughs. Sorry. It just went up the wrong pipe. You okay? Well, you swooshed it right in my face. Sorry. No worries. It's pretty potent. He coughs. Maybe you're cleansing. Hacking cough. He walks into a chair. Ow! I'm blind. Just breathe. Hold that thing away from me. It's sage. It's natural. He walks into a table. Seriously. I'll do the other rooms. He leans over the sink, blinking away the smoke. Turns the tap. No water. We've made a terrible mistake. I thought it at the time. Why didn't I say anything? We made a wrong decision. Inevitable and wrong. We've steered the course of our life into this. I can't tell if my life has been one long mistake or a series of mistakes that have all blurred together. Let's light a fire. I go out to the wood pile. I tear up some newspapers that are sitting in an old enamel cooking pot by the cast iron stove that serves as a, as a fireplace. Headlines from only a few years ago. And they feel like ancient history already. Water rights, pipelines. Feels like a world already gone. It feels metaphorical and good as I prepare to consign these to the flames. Like a ritual act that I have stumbled upon a metaphorical leaving behind of the world. I feel like I'm being watched. It's these pictures. What's taking him so long? Out at the woodpile. I am not prepared for the night, the non-negotiableness of it. Something I can only describe as a spiritual fear overwhelms me. Everything around me, even the air, feels threatening. I am soft and tender. I, I think of teeth. There's a rustling sound. I tell myself it's nothing, but of course it's not nothing. It's something, some kind of something, not nothing. Silence, which does not comfort him. Some creature, possibly a chipmunk, at most a raccoon, who knows, who knows? In the space of a few seconds, his fear goes from chipmunk to a terror that fills the night. He gathers wood. He is pursued by these, these thoughts as he goes inside. How was it? Ah, it's all good. She strikes a match. They touch it to the paper. Then birch bark. It doesn't take. They try again. More paper. Rearrange sticks. Lots of smoke. They clear everything out. Start again. No fire. They lie defeated on blankets in front of an unlit fireplace. Time passes. More time. The blankets are woolen and have a pleasant, musty smell. 
She uses a candle to light other candles. Surrounded by candles. Children, frozen in a moment of joy, stare unblinkingly into the room like they've been there for a thousand years. He puts his hand on her hip. In silence, he tries to experience his ownership of here, all the way in which he deserves this. I dreamed this place. When? Many nights. I didn't tell you before because it freaks you out when I talk like that this. It doesn't freak me out. It makes you angry. I love the way your mind works. And when I saw this place, it matched the dream. And I knew we had to have it. I dreamt that we were in the woods and we were naked. <laughs> and I was decorating you with sticks and flowers and you were a nature god. He likes the way this makes him seem to himself. We deserve happiness. It seems so beautiful to me now. Why can't he experience his life? He is numb to everything. And now I think I don't deserve this. I want to tear it to pieces in my mind. But yes, this is what I deserve. I deserve to be clean, to wash myself in the pristine waters of a lake. I deserve abundance and... What? Mm -hmm. Were you asleep? Uh, I'm not sure. Silence. The eyes of the children. Is my life a joke? She touches his shoulder. Kissing. Caressing. Somewhat spoiled by these stray mosquitoes in the dark. His body makes her feel safe. He drifts off into what feels like sleep, what must be sleep. I lose somehow the reality of the room compelled into a place not strictly speaking here. He is being chased by unseen dogs down the fluorescent lit hallway of an office tower. He contemplates a fire alarm. He is small and furry. He hides in a bathroom stall. An old woman feeds a cat. Above him, a red balloon is slowly losing air. His penis hard has a mouth with teeth, a whining sound. She is awake. A mosquito um, ominous and large in the dark. All hunger fills the universe. She feels her blood softly pulsing in her neck. A shadow crosses the window. An animal. No, a person. Just a branch in the moonlight. No, a person. She sees a face. She grips his arm. The dog bites. He screams. She screams. Silence. And breath. The face is gone. What? Nothing. A uh, moment to orient himself. Runs his hand over his leg. No dog has bitten him. He rolls over. His breathing slows. Maybe she drifts in and out of sleep. Time passes. The sun rises over the lake. Burns away a mist that hovers there. A beetle marches awkwardly over twigs, trilliums. A snake slithers under a rock. A chipmunk scurries for cover. A hummingbird. Maybe she never woke up. When he wakes up, she is not there. A small thrill of fear. He sits up. All the candles have guttered. He looks out through the large plate glass window. Through the dead branches of the pine tree, he sees her. She is at the edge of the lake. She does a sun salutation, and the sun hovers beyond the trees on the other side. This is something she used to do in front of him. Now she only does it when he isn't looking. On the opposite shoreline, she sees something metallic glint in the woods. She shoes away the thoughts of her own death. The face in the window last night. Was it the face of a man? Does she know him from somewhere? Opens the door to the outhouse. A stale smell, not totally unpleasant echo of his own death shimmers through him. A not spiritual horror rises in him, an intimation of his own corrupted flesh. There is a message carved into the wood of the door. It reads, Beware the Ruth Lake Killer. He closes the door. He stands looking around him, the trees, a light breeze in the leaves. Well, what if nature is only an idea I had when I was in the city, something I only saw in pictures and documentaries? What if I hate nature, he thinks. I paid to be in nature. I didn't pay to be part of nature. But we can never really return to the natural world. Something in our brains, the way our brains evolved, or something we did to our brains along the way has exiled us. We get glimpses, and these glimpses make us suffer. 
here and not here is our curse. He goes to the shed and looks at the axe. He picks it up, caresses its well-worn handle. But what's the point of chopping wood if you're incapable of lighting a fire? Later that afternoon, he will wash his hair in the waters of this lake, a ritual cleansing. When he returns, she is there. How was your sleep? Slept like a baby. All this fresh air. <laughs> So you're doing yoga down by the lake? Their conversation is brittle. We need coffee, but there is no electricity, and we're incapable of making a fire. We stand at the large window overlooking the lake. I have a slight headache. This tree... This, this tree is very frustrating. They couldn't see it last night, but there is a large tree in front of the window blocking their view of the lake. It's so tall. And, and all the branches are dead. Looks like it might be a pine tree of some kind. A spruce, maybe? Imagine the view of the lake. I, I feel weird chopping it down. He thinks of the axe in the shed, the weight of it, how good it felt in his hands. Still green on top. It's a big, ugly tree. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swim the lake. When you come back, we can smash the car window and make sandwiches. Well, what about coffee? There's no electricity. We can't light a fire. Why is he angry at me? I didn't lock the keys in the car. There's a stack of old beach towels in a shelf in the closet. He grabs a blue one with gold swirls and a cartoon drawing of a fish on it. Next to the towels, there is an old bottle of shampoo. He reads the label. It says, no tears. And he regrets the perfect shampoo that is locked in the car. He brings the towel and the shampoo down to the shoreline. Through the branches of the large tree, probably a pine tree, some kind of pine tree, obviously, she watches him as he walks down a path toward the lake. She sees him lay his towel on the rock, but mostly what she can see is that big, dead-looking, definitely a pine tree. There is an old rowboat leading against the dead tree. He sees now that it's the same one from the pic pictures on the cottage wall. He places a bottle of shampoo on the rock. He dives into the water. She loses him beneath the surface for a moment, and she is relieved by even this brief absence. She wants to walk in the forest. She is afraid of wild animals, of being devoured. Why did he have to lock the keys in the car? That's just like something he would do. So far, they've been met with a series of disappointments. She is hungry. There is food in the car. She worries about the arguments they will have if neither one of them has the coffee this morning. Maybe she should take matters into her own hands and go out and smash the window herself and make a breakfast. As she thinks these things, she is distracted by the pictures that cover the walls. Children growing, marshmallow roasts, crowding her out. Everyone seems so happy. Time is trapped as sadness in these photos. She wonders what's wrong with her. Why has this kind of happiness eluded her? She opens a drawer. In the back corner, there is a photo. It is the only one with adults. The two adults and two children. The boy and the girl. All four of them stand around the pine tree. The tree is much smaller in this picture. The man, who must be the father, is blurry and indistinct. But the woman, the mother, someone has scratched out her face. She closes the drawer. She thinks of ghosts and her father, and her mind turns to the night before. Was there someone at the window? She can't picture the face she saw so clearly. It seems preposterous now in the light of early morning. She begins taking the pictures down. She puts them and their frames gingerly into a garbage bag. This makes her claustrophobic. She looks at a picture of the boy in a rowboat. He holds up a large string of fish. He's beautiful. Why do we idealize childhood? A time when everything seems possible, but everything isn't possible. A time when we are helpless and easily fooled. We flee into the future, the future like refugees, forced to leave the things we love behind. She looks up. A man's face is framed in the window. He smiles. She screams and drops a picture, which smashes to the floor. He alternates front crawl and breaststroke, his body, his breath, that lovely hollow feeling in his belly, the power of his limbs and his torso, the silver slash of water across his vision. 
At the far shore, a huge gray rock slopes into the water with a pink glint of what he imagines is quartz. The trees swoop out over the lake as though catching themselves mid-fall. The underwater portion of the rock is slick with algae. He slithers himself ashore. And he stands now, his breathing hard. Checks his feet for leeches, for little ones in between the toes. And he's alone. He looks back to the cottage, which is small and remote now. He pulls aside the branch of a tree, walks a few paces, and crosses the boundary into the forest. It's a few degrees cooler in here. The silence overwhelms him. The busyness of his thoughts and this silent permanence of trees. He tries to clear his mind, and he sees a fire pit. He approaches it. Some blood smeared on a rock puts his hand on the embers, which are still warm. She steps outside. There's no one there. She peers into the forest. It is very still and vanishes quickly into the tangle of itself. She leans forward, and now she is brushing aside branches and walking along what may have once been a path, following this idea of a man. She thinks, have I seen this man, his face, before? She tries to locate him in her mind. Nothing, nothing. Hello? Hello? She absently steps over fallen trees. Any movement or shadow and any sound she turns in that direction. She is being led by, by what? Deeper and deeper into... He re-enters the water and swims back across the lake. The water is a bright repository of sun with something terrifying beneath the surface, some awful creature imagined in his childhood. Thoughts of childhood claw at him. He feels the failure of the subsequent years. When he returns, he stands and the water reaches the top of his calves. The water sheets off his body. The sun has mostly burned off the cool of the morning by now. He is breathing from the exertion of swimming, feeling solid in his body. His hunger makes him lightheaded, a not unpleasant feeling. He looks to his right and sees the rowboat still leaning, leaning against the tree. He looks down through the surface of the lake to the ghostly pale of his refracted feet and marvels at the fragility of his own humanity. He thinks of this water as a dream of water. He squeezes a green jewel of shampoo into the palm of his hand. It has a chemical smell. A silent prayer begins to form in his mind. He massages the shampoo into his scalp. It foams and slides down his neck. It plops in rough clouds on the surface of the water. He closes his eyes and crouches. He inhales deeply. And his head is yanked sideways. He reaches up and tries to loosen the grip of a hand fisted in his hair, tries to pry away a finger. He is yanked up into the air. This is not your bathtub, you fucking handrail. It's a, a woman's voice, although it is pitched with such rage it's hard to tell. His head is being yanked from side to side. Get out of the fucking lake before you give you a fucking rectal shampoo. It's definitely a woman's voice. The fish fucking die, the plants die, the lake dies. I want to say this isn't the shampoo I bought. The shampoo I bought has no phosphates, but the, the soap is running into my eyes and I'm blind. I, I thought it was supposed to be no tears. I'm clutching at her forearm, thinking desperate thoughts of survival, shampoo streaking down my forehead and into my eyes, blinking blurred sunshine. This voice, this voice, I know this voice. He wants to reason with it, but this voice is raw with rage and his, this forearm drags him stumbling out of the lake and he, he can't find his balance and he is thrown into a bush. He stands and falls again, his arms carving flailing arcs in front of him, the woman's voice shrieking him down, things about uh, pH balance and the death of fishes. He is crouched and blind, and soap streaks into his eyes. It runs into the cuts of his arms and on his shins. Her form is uncertain and immense, a smudge of darkness against a background of smeary sunshine. Do I know you? <laughs> what have I done? It suddenly occurs to him that he should be afraid for his life. He crawls through the bush and then runs. Though blinded, he can tell more or less which way the forest lies. He is barefoot. It, it hurts when he steps on roots and sticks. He stumble runs with his arms up to protect his face from branches. There he is, naked except for a bathing suit. His head is a puff of white cloud. His arms are waving frantically. I, I give chase. I blink for an instant. The forest comes into sharp relief before the soap burns my eyes closed again. I, I see someone. Uh, they're coming towards me. Who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you? Stay away from me. I'm here. I can't see. She tries to wipe his eyes with I, her sleeve. I scream. It's me. I scream again. It's me. Don't cry. I'm not crying. 
Okay, I'm partly crying, but mostly I didn't have a chance to rinse. My fucking eyes are on fire. Who is she? It's me. It's me. The woman, the woman who attacked me. Take my hand. He grabs for it. Sit. He sits. Don't rub. My eyes. Mm -hmm. The bottle said no tears. You still have to rinse. I'm going to write a letter to the shampoo company. She dabs at his eyes. His sight is returning. The sky is ragged red. He can see trees haloed in light. His wife. Everything is haloed in light. She traces a finger across his forehead. His eyes are red, like he's been crying. This is like in the dream, she thinks. We're sitting on the forest floor, like in my dream. I look up. They are sitting under a tree with a large growth on it. A fungus. Look. It's a large brain-shaped fungus, large, gray, and gelatinous. That tree is thinking. <laughs> he laughs when I take his hand. Tiny white flowers like stars all around us. Time passes. She helps me to my feet. We are walking. What were you uh, doing out in the woods? I don't tell him about the stranger. I tell her about the woman who attacked me. That's strange. My feet are throbbing. Where, where, where are we going? We head toward the lake. I can orient myself. The, the lake is, is this way. We're heading north. The lake is to the east. We're at the tree with the brain again. We've come full circle. I'm, I'm totally turned around. I'm positive the lake is... Does she, in this moment, admit to herself that she kind of wanted to find this stranger, whoever he is? That she was disappointed to find her husband instead? And that given the right circumstance, she probably would have if she had met the stranger in the woods instead of her husband? She feels claustrophobic now. Maybe she dreamt the stranger, and that's why she recognized him. The parameters of her life feel narrow. How could she say any of this? To even think it repudiates her past. It's more like a fact of her body. He is talking, saying, let's go home, but she isn't listening. The past is gone. It isn't real, but it is. It is real. Where else does meaning come from if not the past? Everything about the present echoes with the past. Let's go home, I say. We haven't had coffee. He blames me for everything. We're on edge. Where the fuck are we? He looks at his wife. Her face, what happened to her face? Her face has disappeared and replaced itself with a spiritual calm. He turns, and he sees it. It's magnificent. A deer. A stag. A primordial thought has materialized here. The mind of the forest. Tears fill his eyes. This is why we're here. Nature. This unspoiled creature. All grievances between them forgotten. A long, lush, beautiful silence, ancient thoughts unfolding in time which slowly spreads like a liquid in all directions. Spiritual innocence, a silent witness to I don't know what. All of my movements seem clunky, unformed, my limbs all knuckled and wrong. The deer is unaware of us like the stars are unaware of us. Hardly daring to breathe, I lift out my phone. This is what I think of when I'm not thinking. This space has become sacred. May the memory of this be the last thing that passes through my mind before I die. Before time gets fucked up. Eyes go gray. It looks at me. It looks at nothing. It stumbles off into the trees. And we're alone again. We're lost. And... We're walking. For how long? Deeper and deeper into branches and breath deeper and deeper into cool and wet and breathing, breathing. Dark and branches. I can't feel my feet anymore. Thinking trails behind them. Thinking catches like shirts on branches. Look! What? She points. They are on the road. The sign that reads Ruth Lake with the bloody arrow that points them in the right direction. The direction they were already going. How long were we gone for? The bunny. The deer. 
How did we get so far away? They resigned themselves to the long walk. They were surprised to find themselves holding hands. She, again, for some reason, imagines herself fucking this stranger. She dreams of the lake, fucking this stranger with her clean body, wondering what that would be like. He thinks of the strange woman's forearm, how he gripped it in his panic, of her fist in his hair. What are you thinking? I'm glad we did this. They approached the cottage. Uh, something's different. The front door has been repaired. How long were they gone for? Who repaired it? They walk in. Hello? Hello? Into the main room. Hello? No one is here. Except for the door, everything is just as they left it. Look. He's pointing to the oak dresser against the wall. What is that? An urn? Let's go home. Let's just smash the car window. Just get in the car and just go home now. This is our place. Why doesn't she tell him about the strange man and that it could be him? And what game is he playing? I didn't want it. If this was something you wanted to, to take a leap, you said, take up. Oh, fuck! Was that urn here? Before? I looked down. It wasn't. It wasn't here. Someone's ashes. I've stepped on glass. Who put this here? I've stepped in glass. The shattered picture. I'm bleeding. The picture of the laughing boy that she dropped. I'm bleeding. The beautiful laughing boy in a rowboat with the fish who came back as a man. There's a shard of glass from a shattered picture stuck in my foot. I limp to the couch. Blood is pouring out of me. Hey, uh, the, there are rags in the shed. Is that hygienic? I need to stop the bleeding. I go to the shed. And I'm alone with the urn, which, which I assume contains the ashes of someone. I feel awkward now in its presence, the way I do at parties. Hello, I say. And who might you be? <laughs> Lightheaded from blood loss and hunger and stress and fuck my life. Fuck my life. All the pictures on the walls and the laughter. I hate them. I hate this place. Look what I found. She's back from the shed. She's carrying a box. What about the rags? Here. Three old rags. They're filthy. Much dirtier than I thought. And she's carrying an old damp cardboard box. It's filled with green bottles. And these bottles are filled with a red liquid. The bottles have no labels. I wrap the least filthy of the rags around my foot. I open the cardboard box and take out a bottle. I want to go home, I tell her. I unscrew the cap. The red liquid is wine. She isn't listening. I blow the dust out of two empty jam jars in the cupboard. Okay, is this a good idea? I pour out wine from the first bottle. She hands me a glass. She has pretty eyes. She is such a good person when I think of what her childhood must have been like. Here goes nothing. We drink. Wow. Uh, <laughs> it's a shock to the system. I feel it land and settle in my stomach. Okay, let's get in the car and... One more. And, okay, more wine. Drinking on an empty stomach. The rag is soaked. I look at my body. This is my body. I'm looking at the smashed picture on the floor. <laughs> My body, this is my blood. I switch out the rag, drink wine. Are you crying? The wine, it's making my eyes water. She laughs. He laughs. The face of the, of the laughing you know, boy. Th they gave Jesus a rag soaked in vinegar? Frozen in this moment of joy. Hello, little boy, I say. I know this boy. More wine. More wine. This is my blood. My body made it according to some ancient instruction. The eyes, the shape of the nose. I see it now. Little slivers of glass in my foot. I go to the wall. In all the pictures, there is no mother, no father, only happy children playing. A boy and a... I take down another picture. She hands him the picture. A young girl mid-leap above the lake. Leaping off the foredeck of the rowboat. Brother and sister. They grew up here. I think of the woman with the scratched out face. Was the girl the woman who attacked me? I look down to the lake. It must have been her. The rowboat is missing. It was leaning up against the big dead pine tree when I went for the swim. The swim that, that happened in another lifetime. More wine. I wonder how the cat is doing. Let's, let's, let's go home. More wine. I look at the urn. Whose ashes are in that urn? <laughs> the wine is clawing at my head. <laughs> Why am I weeping? More wine. Me too. The afternoon is uh, getting away from us. Time unspooling. Wine. Smash the car window. Get out of here. More wine. Everything sitting uneasily in my stomach. 
I look out at the dead pine tree that blocks the view of the lake. I think of the axe. The tree is rocking gently in the breeze. A silence descends briefly. I am mesmerized by it. The urn filled with the ashes of... I pour myself more wine. Who? A horror movie unspooling in my mind. Let's lie down. If I sleep, I may never wake up. See, I'm having visions, but the visions I am having are only of this world. Are we awake now? A vision of this tree that is only this tree. A visions of my hand that are only my hand. A cat somewhere along the highway still twitching out the last of its life. I mean, mean the rabbit, the rabbit on the highway. My hips twitch involuntarily. I'm more than just drunk. M- maybe it's some kind of fungus, but he's not feeling these feelings. These feelings are feeling him, and he's not saying these words. These words are saying him. It's the fungus and the wine, that tree with the brain in the woods, and I am thinking the tree's thoughts, the brain, a parasite on that tree, feeding on me. No, 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 it's, it's good to have words, these words. Are they words? I can't tell. Am I making sense? <laughs> um unhappy, and I'm euphoric. Are these tears? <laughs> the sky, that beautiful, mostly dead pine tree. No, I will not lie down. I should lie down on something cool, the earth, the soil. My wrists are hilarious, so vulnerable, so feminine. My mother said such pale and dainty wrists. I am the knight that guards my wrists, you shining, beautiful, you beings of light, so perfect, so functional. How do you coordinate your movements so everything a dance, the sun, our bodies, my mind, the fungus, the leaves on the trees, more wine, more wine. Honey. Brain full of bees. I raise my glass, spilling over with red, blood red, murky too, like blood. Lift a glass, a blood-filled glass, an offering to the gods. Lift it to my father who... And everyone leans forward. What will she say? We wound each other, slash and stab with words to open old wounds so we can bleed afresh, to vibrate with the urgency of childhood. Fuck me. My teeth are red. My tongue is red. This is my body. This is my blood. And I am down by the lake. And I am lying on the sun-warm rock, and I dream. The sun is a pulsing blob in a swollen sky. At least, I think it's a dream. Maybe it's only thinking. Maybe it's dreaming. Memory, dream, memory, dream. The heat of the rock, the slow poison of the wine. I float, flying. I drift over water, over the trees who laugh at me, or silently look up and wonder. My flight is clumsy and silly. I wave goodbye to my husband, who is semi-conscious on the forest floor. Losing blood, making more blood. His lips moving, (laughs) words burbling up through sleep. Beware the roof-like killer. My heart beats hard as my body expands in this pool of cool, soft slumber. (laughs) I carve my hand in the wind. I see a man in an old rowboat. The muscles of his back send ripples out in concentric circles on the surface of the water. Now I look up from the bottom of the lake, at the sky through the ripples on the surface. The clunk of aura on the oarlock echoes thickly through into the depths. Hollow wooden sound and water sound pulls me out of the physical reality of these things and through my body into some story of the past. The past like a parasite on the present. The present which is tethered to objects through my senses. I float away on this memory, not a memory, somewhere deep and unseeing underwater. The word memory without its meaning. The water like sky, sky distorted as oars plunge in, disturbing the surfaces of sky. Her fingers claw me, pull me under. With the glittering green and brown backs of fish sliding beneath the hull of the boat. Twitching, twitching, earthworms, soil, the roots of trees, strong knotted arms or fingers of her hands in my mouth. She pulls me into mulchy bits. She lands tippy-toe like a dancer on the shore, looks out and sees the man in his boat. He rows towards her. This takes some time. The stranger. The laughing boy who is a man with a grim, set face. He lands the boat. A hissing, crunching sound. Horsetails and the grit of the shoreline. He gets out of the boat. Found Pine Point. This is Pine Point? Yeah, over there is Diving Rock. She lies down. He makes a line of blueberries from her collarbone along her sternum to her lower abdomen. He describes the river that connects Ruth Lake to Wolf Lake. 
She fucks him, feeling away the fact of desire until it becomes only fucking, dissolving into only bodies. The brain of the, the wine is weaving itself into his mind. His eye becomes the eye of the tree. It swivels toward the east, and he sees his wife fucking a man by the shoreline. His hips twitch. He's lost her. He knows he's lost her. He's lost her a thousand years ago. When he comes inside her, she throws up into the lake. Hundreds of tiny fish slide out of her throat. She turns away from him and walks naked through the woods. His wetness slides out of her and onto the forest floor. Flowers spring from the outline of what used to be my hands. He climbs into his boat, pushes off from the shore. His boat is full of fishes. He thinks I could survive forever on those fishes. Wading through the underbrush, it is dark. She is standing over me. He lies on the forest floor. You left me here. You're holding the axe. So I am. The handle is warm in my grip, the temperature of my flesh. It's very dark. Time has passed. The doomed tree sways above me. The moon clings to its branches as my body softens toward him. Some corresponding place inside me hardens. How much time has passed? Since when? Since I don't know. I smell smoke. Did you light the fire? Who lit the fire? I look out at the lake, shining, glittering, shards of silver leaping like knives into the water. I want to be home. I want to be nowhere. I want to go back to normal. I think of our cat. I hear the clunk of oarlocks. Our cat floating in the sky blue rug. And the lazy sound of water sliding off an oar, back into its source. He drags his boat full of fishes ashore. Silver bodies twitching in the hull, overflowing the gunwale. There are many versions of myself looking out over this lake. He guts them. His hands work fast. I imagine his father who taught him how to do this. His father who built this cottage, who took those photographs. The son ashamed of his useless hands. This is how I imagine my father who is dead, imagining me. The meat of the fish is slick and clean, little knots of blood. With the wine still shimmering in our systems, we approach the voices in the dark. A man and a woman sit by a fire out in the woods. We hover like ghosts, just beyond the firelight. They gather round the fire, gather round stories disguised as themselves, the past that keeps gathering here, crowding out the present. They sing. Are singing still. Fires burning, fires burning. The sister burning. speaks. Father, can you hear me? I know you can. I can feel you all around me, in the trees, in the wind as it ripples across the lake, in the joists and beams of this cottage that you built for us. This cottage, the boathouse, the canoe that you taught yourself how to make. When mother left, your heart was broken. And with your broken heart, you made all of this. All of this is your love. All of this is your warm embrace. The blood in the soil out by the wood pile, where you chopped off the tip of your little finger, out by the road allotment when you fell off the ladder. Here's to you. We're out here. We're out in the dark. The smell of fish, fat falling into the fire. I'm so hungry. I've been hungry for a thousand years. Tell me the story of the Ruth Lake killer. The man leans forward, looks at his sister across the fire. Have you been for a walk in the woods, my sister? Notice the bent twigs? The little piles of leaves that don't quite look right? Movement in a window out of the corner of your eye? I look over my shoulder into the pitch black behind me. I wish there was a glow of the fire. What did we awaken by coming here? Are we to blame? Am I in this story? Enjoy this warmth. Reassure yourself with the firelight. But this fire, as comforting as it is on such a dark night, this small glow of comfort, the sound of human voices. Do you remember little Kai? That little blonde girl from up the way, the two of you used to swim together, sing songs in the canoe. Oh, the lake was teeming with fish back then. I remember her quite well. I had a little crush on her. and It was harmless enough. She was very small, so fragile and innocent. 
but the Ruth Lake killer has the instincts of an animal, a hunter. He likes the small, the defenseless. He prowls the dark with an ax in his hand. I remember Kai. The last time I saw Kai, we were sitting around this very fire. A warm, homey feeling with songs and hot dogs. It was late and she was tired. Father was up at the cottage asleep. Kai stood up and smoothed her dress over her thighs. Her thighs were thin and unwomanly, innocent-seeming. I wanted to offer to walk her back up to the cottage, but I was too shy. I lifted my hand like, like this to wave goodbye, but she had already turned her back on the fire, and her attention was wholly given to the mysterious dark, the dark we had accidentally created by lighting a fire. I remember watching her in her pale summer dress with tiny faded blue flowers, her pale arms, her pale legs, slipping, slipping, shrinking, submerging in darkness. Are you really talking about our mother? Where did our mother go? I can't remember if I was aware at the time that I would never see her again, that no one would ever see her again. The Ruth Lake killer is drawn to the light of a campfire. Who knows why? Maybe because he knows that's where the human flesh is, the human flesh he craves. Or maybe deep, deep inside him, there is some soft, warm memory of home, some ancient impulse towards community. Where is the girl now? That he is drawn here for the same reason we all are. But he knows this is not for him that he has exiled himself, and so he waits beyond this solace that we've made, a cradle made of nothing but the uncertain and permanent light of the fire. He waits in the dark, willing someone to step into the darkness with him. Shh. It's my heart. It's my heart kicking in my chest. I hold my breath. We are ghosts. Fat falls into the fire, and the fire flares. The sister holds up the urn. Tomorrow morning, as the sun rises, let's take Daddy to the old pine tree. Let's make a circle around the tree. And as we bury his ashes, let's each make a silent vow, and maybe a vow for ourselves too, that we will somehow, in spite of everything, remain. That we will somehow, in spite of everything, continue. Let's vow to keep this spot sacred in our hearts, to visit it, if not in body, maybe in body, but if not, then in our hearts and we'll pour wine into the earth and say a prayer. This is my body. It doesn't matter that what we've lost, because we can't lose ourselves. The story of how Daddy built the boathouse, of how he built the bunkies for us as we grew bigger, how he made the rowboat that we used to roughhouse and fish in. And every year when Mother didn't return, he made the place more beautiful and more alluring. Nothing can take away the after-dark games of Kick the Can, how we sat in the rafters and told stories of the Ruth Lake killer, of horrors in the outhouse, how each year we would wonder, are the blueberries going to be plentiful? Is the road going to be overgrown? Did the beavers build a dam in the outlet? And someday, if our mother returns, she will know to come to the tree, the tree where we were last a family. When father planted this pine tree, it was a tiny seedling then. He told us, let this be a timely reminder of who we are, of these happy times, which won't last forever. The big dead pine tree in front of the window. I feel the ax in my hand. Have I always had this ax? Why have I never used it? My face dissolves in the dark. My eye is big and round and gelatinous. I cut my face on low-hanging branches. I drag the ax through the dark, and by instinct I arrive at the old dead pine tree. Everything around me is shadow and moonlight and the weak glow of the campfire. I swing the ax. The tree cries out. I swing it again. The ax glances out of my hand. The blade lodges in the meat of my leg, just behind the shin bone. He screams and goes down. <laughs> now I'm standing above him, holding the bloody ax. Breath. 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 This is my blood. 
breath in the dark out beyond the firelight. It lurches out of me. It runs down my shin, seeps into the soil. This is my blood. They remain frozen in this tableau. His naked torso twisted in the ecstasy on the forest floor. She is silhouetted in moonlight. I can see the veins in her forearm as she grips the axe. A gray sky now. Water clinging to and then falling from leaves. I'm curled around the, the tree. He's shivering. Heatless sun rises. I'm slipping. I'm in and out of dreams. Birds, leaves, insects. Look. I look. An elderly woman standing on the shore. She looks out over the lake. She doesn't see us. She stands against a wind which is only the force of the now meeting the past. Her white hair is pinned under a white pink, a wide pink brimmed hat. Her hand hovers above her eyes, shielding them from the sun. The other hand cradles the urn. Filled with the ashes of... The contours of her body feel solid. Mother? He speaks the word as though reclaiming his right to it. Mother, like a grenade about to blow up in her own hand. Her mingled absence and presence, and how did she arrive here across the bridge of time that separates her from this place? She turns to the pine tree. She puts her hand on it as if to feel its pulse. She gave them life and gave them their primal hurt. Mother. Mother? She doesn't hear them. My mouth is dry. In the middle of paradise. And I'm weeping and I have an enormous headache. I'm tired. Tired of saying things. The susurration of leaves, clatter of insects. Time. Clouds roll in. The rain comes. I listen to the rain. I press my body to his body. He is cold. I'm lying. We are naked. The cottage is gone. The mother is gone. I am decorating him with flowers. And somehow I know all their names. Everything is ash. I am bug bitten, covered in dirt, naked, entwined. How did I end up caught here on the surface of the water? Fish flashing silver in the bloody cloud that billows out beneath me. When I wake, the sky is clear. I sleep again. I can see my breath. I can see my breath. I can see my breath.